Good morning and welcome to today's episode of Women Empowerment Program being organized and sponsored by the Rule of Law and Empowerment Initiative, also known as Partners West Africa Nigeria P1. My name is Nkem Okereke, your host for this program, and I'm also here with my co-host Ijoma Igwe. For today, we shall be discussing the topic sexual harassment in institutions. And by institutions, we mean schools, government institutions, and every other formal institution. We deemed it an important topic of discussion because it can be seen as an epidemic in our institutions, workspaces, and many other formal organizations. Some research has shown that the major reason for sexual harassment is poverty on the side of the woman and provocative dressing too. I think there shouldn't be an excuse to any form of crime because it can even create a hostile environment and termed illegal. With our guest today, we shall discuss the different forms of sexual harassment, what is expected of a victim, and how it can be prevented. We will go on a short break now and then come back with our guest for this topic. Please stay tuned. Good morning and welcome back to the show. My name is Ijoma Igwe. So to discuss this topic, sexual harassment in institutions with us is a gender expert who has over nine years experience within the development sector. She advocates and builds the capacity of communities and institutions on gender transformative processes. Her experience working on gender integration includes health, sexual and reproductive health and rights, gender-based violence, education, protection, system strengthening, policy reform processes, female empowerment, amongst others. Please welcome with us this morning, Ms. Obianuju Osude. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, morning Ms. Obianuju. I hope Osude or Osude, how, did, how, how is it pronounced? Osude is fine. Osude. Okay. You. You're welcome to the show. Thank you so much You're for having me. Have mm, it's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, so you, you see our topic, you said what our topic is, and I want to find out from you. What is sexual harassment? In my opinion, I'll say that um, sexual harassment is an unwelcome sexual behavior that okay. is very offensive, mm -hmm. um, intimidating, and also quite humiliating for the recipient. Okay. And why I emphasize on the recipient is because we ha we've had cases whereby when people do these things, they say, but that was not my intention. So the focus usually is on how your behavior, your words, your written documents have made someone else feel. Yeah. So sexual harassment, it's not just because typically the conversation talks about men harassing women. Sexual harassment can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. It could be men against women. It could be women against men. Mm -hmm. It could be women against women. Mm -hmm. It could be men against women. Mm -hmm. It could even be amongst children. Yeah. So, it's the most important thing is that when we're looking at sexual harassment, we should look at it in such a way that nobody's immune to sexual harassment. And it comes in various forms. It could be verbal. The words I speak to someone else. I might imply it or my, I might explicitly ask for sexual favor. Mm -hmm. I might make sexual comments or I might insult someone, typically in the market, or maybe we've had situations whereby women in Nigeria say that once they have an issue with someone, the next thing the person calls them is a shell. Mm -hmm. That's another form of sexual harassment because that's words. Mm -hmm. Then another form of sexual harassment is physical. That is where you talk about physical contact, mm -hmm. touching someone, or even in the person's demeanor, mm -hmm. in the way you look at someone. There have been instances where people have complained about looking at them in a the very sexual way. It makes them totally uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Then it can also be written. Written is a situation whereby you actually share documented, um, it might be Seems. pictures, mm -hmm. it might be words. It could even be in outright sharing of pornographic materials. Mm -hmm. And then there's one I normally talk about that um, people are not so comfortable with. We've had cases whereby even persons who advocate for human rights, in a situation whereby, let's say, you're handling a case of a child who might have been sexually um, 
abused and then you're sharing on social media platform yeah. this child without clothes on mm -hmm. i've had instances where i was in the train and somebody outrightly showed me a child's private part because they were trying to take it to court typically mm -hmm. That kind of image should not be for public consumption, yeah. one. And it shouldn't be something that anybody else should see. It. it is evidence that should be presented in court and mm -hmm. it should be sealed because you're not just dealing with the present, you're also dealing with the future of this exactly. child. Yeah. And then more commonly in today's world, we have online sexual harassment, yeah. especially, particularly targeted against women and girls. Mm -hmm. You have things like revenge porn, mm -hmm. whereby you have um, a situation whereby a woman has dated someone and once the relationship ends, the person releases sexual materials on that woman online mm -hmm. so these are various forms of sexual harassment and like I mentioned nobody is immune to it anybody yeah. can fall victim of sexual harassment and it can happen anywhere yeah. even in public um, transportation systems mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like you've mentioned earlier it's perpetrated mostly against women especially regarding the what do you call it the media stuff what did you call it what was it then revenge, revenge porn revenge yeah. porn ex, 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 yeah, yeah it's always targeted at women so that is why we are going to focus today on sexual harassment against women mm -hmm. in institutions so thank you very much for that and uh, if you have taught me I, I i didn't know sexual harassment had a definition to this extent mm -hmm. yes so i'm going to ask you what do you think causes sexual har harassment? What can be the factors? What can you say that are the factors that cause sexual harassment? Okay, if I'm going to be looking at the topic like in institutions. Okay. So let me just start by saying that like every other form of gender-based violence, sexual um, harassment is actually driven by power relations. Who has more power? Okay. Who has less power? Mm -hmm. And what drives power relations? It starts with gender inequality, especially mm -hmm. when we're talking about women and girls. Now, in the society, who are the decision makers who usually hold more power at household level, at community level within institutions? Mm -hmm. If we look at the statistic, if we look at the statistics, is usually men, mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about male-dominated sectors. Okay, okay. And then, interestingly, if we look at the Nigerian society as a whole, the way we've been socialized, because socialization actually plays a key role. It determines who has more power. Mm -hmm. If the society places more value on a particular gender, if the society says, oh, we place more value on the boy because he's the hope of the family, he's the one who carries the family name forward, who does the um, community, the family invest more in? The boy. Mm -hmm. Then when you invest more in an individual, if there is little or no money in the family and you have to send just one person to school, who do you send to school? The boy. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to decision making, who do you say, oh, you should sit in the presence of elders, the boy? Mm -hmm. So what have you done? Right from an early age, you have placed an immense amount of power on one particular individual. Mm -hmm. And while a lot of our boys, not even a lot of our boys, culturally, boys are socialized to celebrate their sexuality. Mm -hmm. Girls are socialized to be ashamed of their sexuality. Mm -hmm. So not only have you placed a lot of power in this individual, excuse me, this is the person that is most likely to hold high positions. Mm -hmm. That's a power Thing playing out. This is the person that is most likely to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So if I walk into the police station, for example, and if I need to talk to someone and I'm giving a male police officer, do you really think it's easier for that male police officer to step into my shoes? Mm -hmm. This is the person I might have to turn to if I need help. He's mm -hmm. the community leader. Mm -hmm. He's the leader within the organization. Mm -hmm. He's probably the headmaster. Mm -hmm. He's probably my lecturer. Mm -hmm. You've automatically placed immense power in one person's hands. Yeah. But then when you don't put an accountability mechanism in place, what have you done? Power is in one hand, but there's nobody to check that power. Mm -hmm. So that's why sexual harassment, at the root of it, is power relations, especially power relations driven by gender inequality. Mm -hmm. It's more prevalent among women and girls because they're usually the one in subordinate positions. Mm -hmm. They're usually the one whose voices are not usually heard. Mm -hmm. They're usually the ones who have been socialized to be ashamed of their sexuality in such a way that when a girl says that she has been raped, or that she has been sexually harassed. Mm -hmm. People are more likely to say, what were you wearing? Yeah. Where were you? Mm -hmm. Why were you smiling at him? Mm -hmm. Don't you know that men and boys are wired that way? So what does the society do? Because we've placed immense power mm -hmm. in the hands of a particular group the of individuals. Exactly. They are these decision makers. Mm -hmm. Then when you're making decisions, who automatically do you make decisions in their favor? Exactly. The people who hold the power. And what that now means is that when the subordinate ones complain, because we've been raised to be ashamed of our sexuality, the fault is blamed or is placed on the girls and the women. Mm -hmm. But then what does that do? It creates a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. The more you place the blame on the victim or the survivor, the more you empower the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. 
And this does not just happen in our society. You see playing out in a lot of institutions. Yeah, because if yeah. institutions, in institutions, institutions are made up of individuals, be they schools, be they churches, be they workplaces, they're made of individuals. And these individuals come as products of their socialization processes. Mm -hmm. So it's important that individual and um, the institutions right from the beginning spell out what their organizational culture is. What do they stand for? What do they stand against? And then take measures to make sure that anybody who comes into that system is adequately oriented to understand why they stand for that and why it's not going to be tolerated. Thank you very much. And like, like you said, it's mostly against women. That's why we are focusing on sexual harassment against women in institutions. And you have mentioned again that um, so many issues cause these things to happen to women and we said power relations. So we we'll want to know again, why else do you think that is perpetrated against women more than against men? What other things do you think can make it to be done against women than against men? Okay. So when I'm looking at against women and if I'm looking at institutions, so I've already said that when you come and look at power relations, they have more power. Mm -hmm. And then sexual, when it comes to our sexuality, they are more proud of, they are proud of their sexuality. Then women and girls are just pleased to be ashamed of their sexuality. Mm -hmm. Then another key thing that I think it happens more to women is when you look at who can easily ask for help or speak up for help. And I'm not talking about just voicing it out. I'm not talking about economic power, having the money. I need services. And the economic power I'm not talking about is not just services as, but okay, I have an issue, I need help. No. Can I have access to information? Because the information is also power. Yeah. A lot of women, especially women in isolation or girls in isolation, actually have to depend on the decision makers in their lives for information. So if a woman is within a system or a girl is within a system and she's not equipped with that information, on what to do or where to go for help or why this is wrong. Because we know there's something we even call secondary level of victimization, whereby when women and girls go through certain things, that's the primary level. But the secondary level is now when by they've been actually socialized to actually see themselves as the problem. Normally we're talking about the external part of it. Mm -hmm. Every other person but themselves. They're actually socialized to see themselves as the problem. So when they're harassed, for example, and even when you even hear sometimes, even in the development sector, we make that mistake. When we're talking about it, we tend to say women and girls should do this. Women and girls should do that. But then you forget that an individual has to be internally empowered to be able to do that thing that you're saying they should do. If you're telling me that, oh, you shouldn't put yourself in a situation whereby you should be harassed, what does that mean? So that means that me going to the market is me putting myself in a situation where I should be harassed. Mm -hmm. Me going to school is me putting myself in a situation where I should be harassed. Mm -hmm. Me asking to maybe meet my lecturer to explain why I scored a particular grade is me putting myself in a situation where I should be harassed. But then when a boy or a man does that, he is not putting himself in a situation where he should be harassed. Mm -hmm. So it manifests in various ways. And because of the way we've been socialized, we actually disempower women, not just by no access to education or no access to information, even in the way we've socialized women and girls. And then they start seeing themselves as a problem. And when there's actually a problem, because many times these things continue happening if there isn't check. And that check is not just about the mechanisms it's, it's the ability for that person to say, do you know what, I'm uncomfortable with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Because the truth of the matter, we live in a world driven by diversity. Mm -hmm. Everybody comes from various backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And what I might be uncomfortable with might be different from what another person might be comfortable, uncomfortable mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. because there are various ranges. There are people who might come from a background whereby they express by themselves by hugging, yeah. by touching. Mm -hmm. There are communities whereby, or in countries whereby they kiss on both cheeks before. Mm -hmm. they, but then we have communities where a man and a woman shouldn't even be sitting together. Mm -hmm. So while we have the universal definition for sexual harassment, it means different things when you break it down to those components and to that, when you break it down to issues around location. Yeah. It means a different thing when you're talking about an adult woman and a young girl. Mm -hmm. It means a different thing when you're talking about a woman who probably is the head of an organization or a woman who is in the informal sector that has no protection mechanism whatsoever. Exactly. So it, when it, it's quite, um, I'm trying to look for the English. It's quite cumbersome. A, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's we we it's but when you look at all the causes mm -hmm. at the very foundation of it all, 
-hmm. at the root of it all mm -hmm. is power relations. Thank you very much, Miss Ju Osude. I know you have plenty of questions, but yeah. then we'll be going on a short break. <laughs> when we come back, we'll continue with this wonderful conversation. Thank you very much. And our viewers, please stay tuned. Welcome back to the show. I hope you're enjoying this interesting conversation we are having in the studio. But before we went for the break, you gave us the different cases where sexual harassment could occur and different forms of sexual harassment. But what advice would you give to anyone facing any kind of sexual harassment at all? Anyone experiencing it? Okay. The advice I would give, especially when you're experiencing sexual harassment, is first of all, it starts with what space are you operating in? Okay. Are you in school? Are you in the workplace? Yeah. Are you in a government institution? But then the most important thing is that regardless of where you are, what mechanisms exist within that institution when it comes to issues around sexual harassment? Mm -hmm. Typically, I even advise that even before you join an institution, for example, if I'm looking for a work in an organization, while we're rounding up conversation, one of the first things I actually look at, what does this organization actually stand for? And the organizations, for example, by share their policies with you, it's mm -hmm. important to also see their policies. What then happens if I face this or this? Because the truth of the matter is that it's quite prevalent in our society. Yeah. And if you're in school, if I'm a mother taking my child to school, I want to know what child protection mechanisms that school has. Mm -hmm. Because children are minors. They're under 18. Yeah. And many times when they experience this thing, they might, they, we've had instances where my children are told that if you tell your parents, mm -hmm. we will kill your parents or mm -hmm. I will kill your parents. Mm -hmm. It's not by educating my child, first of all, what does this mean? Is, ad, experts have even advised not to call um, our sexual parts by all those um, uh, interesting names. Mm -hmm. So, oh, my peepee, no. Help children understand that somebody shouldn't touch certain parts of their body. Mm -hmm. Help them understand the value of their personal space. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about telling them that, oh, this is your personal space and nobody should come to your personal space and people should respect your personal space. It starts with us as parents actually respecting that personal space in the mm -hmm. sense that if, for example, that child is uncomfortable about something, it's easier for them to actually come to you to talk to you about it. Mm -hmm. But when we act or treat our children like they have no voice mm -hmm. or we know everything, they shouldn't be able to tell us things. Or when they tell you, oh, somebody did something, they say, oh, how did you know? Mm -hmm. So you are learning bad things, Abby. Mm -hmm. What automatically happens in an instance is that when that child is actually facing those things or in various spaces where they're working, regardless of their age, mm -hmm. there are a lot of us that maybe we're raised in such a way that our parents didn't allow us to speak up about certain things. Yeah. Even as adults, it yeah. makes it difficult. Even as adults or even as um, older adolescents or early adults in universities, mm -hmm. when you're facing those kind of things, your parents are the last people you want to speak people. with. Yeah. Because... They've made you feel that when it happens, it's actually your fault. Mm -hmm. So if I'm taking my child to a particular school, I want to know what child protection mechanism that school has. Mm -hmm. What policies do they have to actually protect my child? Mm -hmm. What then happens if my child faces a certain thing? What are they going to do? Mm -hmm. Are they going to be the kind of institution that will hide it from me and try to shut my child up? Mm -hmm. If my daughter or if I'm a woman that I'm getting a job in a particular environment, knowing how prevalent it is in our society. For me personally, one of the things I look at, I want to look at the policies that the organization actually is guided by. Okay. Organizations that don't have any form of policy protecting you against sexual harassment. That means because the policy is usually the first point. Mm -hmm. That is actually what you hold your organization accountable by. Before you start talking about, oh, having a reporting mechanism, mm -hmm. and all that, that is actually the, the organization's written obligation to you as a staff. How does the organization protect you in that environment? If the organization doesn't have it, that automatically tells you that if you're going to experience this in this organization, there is no protection mm -hmm. unless you go to the security agencies or the justice institutions. Mm -hmm. We know how imperfect our, our security and justice system is. Mm -hmm. And then if, apart from the fact that I'm working within the institution, once I join the organization, it's not about writing it down. Mm -hmm. I take my time to now observe what is the culture. Exactly. What is the culture? How is the organization actually investing in these things? 
So should I experience such a thing as maybe a professional woman? Mm -hmm. My first port of call is usually HR. Okay. And not just HR, I would like to talk to someone I trust to express myself. And I would always say, as a woman in that kind of environment, should you experience something like that, please don't say that it happened only once. Mm -hmm. Sexual harassment does not need to happen more than once. Exactly. It should be reported. It's not like bullying. Mm -hmm. Bullying is where you establish a pattern of behavior. Sexual harassment, you don't need to establish a pattern of behavior. Yeah. Even if it happened half. It as long as it makes you uncomfortable. Yeah. I've had an instance whereby an individual walked up to me. I was on building capacity of a particular group of people. And she walked up to me and said, please, do you mind telling my male colleagues that given my background, I'm uncomfortable with people touching me on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I picked it up and the next, and I used that. I didn't, I didn't even wait. I used that as one of the topics for the training. I said, mm -hmm. you have to be sensitive to people's context. Yeah. The fact that you come from a context where you can touch, that does not mean that you should automatically touch people. I personally, before I touch someone, I'm quite, especially in the professional environment, I'm, I'm the first one to say, oh, do you mind? Because that which you're comfortable with does not automatically mean that the other person is comfortable with it. So where am I getting with this? If I'm in that kind of environment, it's also an opportunity for me to also make sure that people also understand where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. This person might be touching your shoulders because their background is, oh, they're quite tactile. They touch when they're trying to express themselves. Mm -hmm. that, I use that as a teacher when I say, oh, I'm uncomfortable with you touching my shoulders. Okay. It becomes now a problem whereby the person says, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Just a small touch of, on the shoulders, you're complaining. Mm -hmm. Please don't let anybody make you feel you're wrong because of how you feel. Mm -hmm. If you're uncomfortable with something, it is your feeling. And it is the responsibility of the other person to respect mm -hmm. your feeling. Yeah. And this does not just apply to us as adults. Like I said, it also applies to children. So as much as we're talking to children about these things, we should also help them understand or even teach them by our own actions that yeah. their voice is actually valuable. Their mm -hmm. feelings are valuable. Mm -hmm. And we also take that into consideration when making decisions. What that does for them is that even when they grow up to become adults, mm -hmm. it's yeah. easier for them speak to speak up. up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much. I'm mm -hmm. going to ask you one more question from what you have said. So mm -hmm. speaking about reporting, do you think there are reporting mechanisms that are effective in this country? <laughs> we all know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. okay. It's a good thing you said, do I think? Mm -hmm. In it's my opinion, opinion mm -hmm. I feel that our systems are highly ineffective. Mm -hmm. And why I'm saying that is that um, looking at our society, Many times, because we're, we're a beautiful country, we're a multicultural country, mm -hmm. a multi-religious country. Mm -hmm. But then the thing about it is that our diversity is both an asset and a liability. Yeah. It is a liability when we actually use our diversity as an excuse to permit actions that shouldn't exist. We actually call them harmful practices. Mm -hmm. So why would a girl or a woman complain about being sexually harassed. And the first thing they say, don't you know that the man is the head of the home? Mm -hmm. Don't you know that that is how men have been formed? Who mm -hmm. said that? Mm -hmm. Or who actually, where is it written? Or is it that the minute a man or a boy is born, on their forehead it is written, here comes mm -hmm. he who does not control, who cannot control his instinct. Mm -hmm. And I've had this where people ask me that. I said, okay, can I ask you a question? If you feel, truly feel that men and boys cannot control themselves, I personally feel that it's actually an insult on men and boys because they are human beings. Mm -hmm. And when you say they cannot control themselves, the question I have is this. What if they decide, oh, because they are giving me that instance for sexual harassment, especially for issues around the rape. Mm -hmm. They say, but well, you know men and boys cannot control themselves. I say, okay, let me ask you a question. Imagine that you're a man. You see this beautiful woman. You decide that you're going to have sexual intercourse with her. You're, you've, you've, in fact, you decided you're going to rape her. Mm -hmm. And at the point of raping her or at the point of penetration, you find out that she's HIV positive. What do you do? You say, oh, no, exactly. I will stop. I say, then you've proven my point. You, you actually have control, mm -hmm. but you've chosen not to, have. Not to use that control, mm -hmm. that self-control, mm -hmm. because you're in an environment that excuses your bad behavior. You are in a system that takes so long for justice to be meted out that it makes it easier for certain actions to thrive. Mm -hmm. I agree. 
So why am I giving this example? Because when you look at our system, when victims have to wait for so long to get justice, when victims are shouted down when they speak about their experiences, mm -hmm. when excuses are made for perpetrators, what does it do? First of all, it encourages certain acts to continue, mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Two, it discourages people from reporting. Mm -hmm. Because we actually believe, for gender experts and also for child safeguarding experts, they usually say, we usually say this thing that, when I'm in, working in an organization and I'm not receiving reports, Lack of reports means that there is a problem. It doesn't yeah. mean that it's not happening. Because we look at the context. Mm -hmm. We look at what acceptable behavior is considered within that context. Mm -hmm. And if we're looking at the acceptable behavior and then reports are not coming in, that means nobody is willing to report. And mm -hmm. then what does that tell me? There's something wrong with the system. Exactly. Because if the system encourages people to speak up, mm -hmm. if the system is shaped in such a way that it protects victims or survivors it empowers them mm -hmm. people are more willing or will be more likely to report but when the system shuts them down or when the when victims or survivors report and then the system because many times you look at our security and justice system once mm -hmm. you report a case mm -hmm. a case especially sexual violence and other the system focuses so much on punishing the perpetrator but nobody pays attention to your rehabilitation yeah. so even when the perpetrator quote unquote is in jail you're left to nurse your wounds. Mm -hmm. So who will be encouraged? You should you should system. feel good that the person is uh, already being punished. Exactly. That's what that's what is exactly. assumed. But that's what is assumed. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is that we know various acts of sexual violence, including sexual harassment, that the effect on an individual actually goes beyond the surface. Yeah. It attacks your self-esteem. Yeah. It makes you blame yourself. Mm -hmm. It makes you question your self-worth. Mm -hmm. When you dress up to go out, the first question that comes to your head, have I dressed in such a way that will encourage somebody to speak to me a certain way or to touch me a certain way? Mm -hmm. If you're walking in the market, you're so conscious. We, yes, actually, evidence has actually shown that people who have experienced sexual harassment also have post-traumatic stress disorder. So when the system just focuses on, oh, we punish and mm -hmm. we move forward, mm -hmm. what does that do? You've punished. The person is in jail. Yeah. The person is in jail being fed with taxpayers' money. Exactly. But this individual is left to nurse their wounds. Yeah. So on one hand, the system is quite ineffective. On the other, when it's actually active, it focuses so much on the punishing the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And then who actually turns to the victim or the survivor? It's actually a very big one. And interestingly, a lot of survivors and victims, even after they are in jail, mm -hmm. have to live with the stigma and the discrimination from, that come from being considered not marriage-worthy, mm -hmm. an incomplete woman or girl, mm -hmm. because you've been harassed. Or in some cases, or not even in some cases, especially if, you, if the harassment has gone to the point that it becomes sexual assault or you've been raped. Yeah. And that's actually why people don't do People don't report. People don't report. And then another aspect I was even looking at, even the psychosocial effect it has on the victim. Mm -hmm. I think that part is not even what is discussed. People just want to say, oh, the physical evidence is what they want. But mm -hmm. then there are a lot of things going in the, the head of the victim, like, ah, ah, ah. But then you go to the security agency to report, they want to say, oh, where did he touch you? Where did he? But then there are a lot of things, and I'm wondering. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I really appreciate your what you have done. I, I, I like your thoughts, your thought pattern on this particular topic. I must say it was a very good one and very interesting one. Yeah, I really learned a lot from this topic alone, sexual harassment in institutions. You have spoken how it can be prevented. You have spoken a lot of things. You have explained what sexual harassment is, and I really appreciate it. Before we go, Ijama, do you have other questions to ask her? Yeah, you've said how it can be prevented, but then, you know, you talked a little about organizations having policies and all that. What if... We have policies, they're on paper. How do we make institutions implement these policies, especially with schools? You talked about schools. Yes, you, if you want to see the policy, they can show you, oh, we have this mechanism in place, mm. but how do we find out if they are actually really implemented mm. and if these children or adults in the workplaces are safe? Mm. So some of the things I check to find out if it's just paper especially regardless of what the institution is it. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have a policy. The next question I'm going to ask you, what is your prevention and response mechanism like? Okay. The policy has shown us your vision. Mm -hmm. It's your theory. Now we want to see your practical. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking about prevention, prevention starts by, first of all, how much are you investing in 
creating awareness, sensitizing, training, because sensitization is totally different from training. Yeah. Sensitizing those within that institution, helping individuals understand how dangerous the misuse of power could be. Mm -hmm. Because many times people don't even understand the kind of power they have. Mm -hmm. And that power can either be used intentionally or in, unintentionally to harm other people. Mm -hmm. It's important to help, especially those in leadership positions, unpack that concept of power. What does it mean for my position? Mm -hmm. How am I using it? Help people be able to relate with this policy at a personal level. Because mm -hmm. if they, they are not able to see this at a personal level, every other thing is just... Uh, black ink on white paper. Mm -hmm. So it's through capacity building, it's through creation of awareness, it's through sensitization. Mm -hmm. And then apart from that, what have what are those measures you've actually put in place to make sure that should they decide to report, there is somewhere to report to? Mm -hmm. I've asked these questions to organizations and I've had people tell me, oh, we have a box. Mm -hmm. And then I say, where is this box? Guess what? This box is at the reception. So everybody can see me oh, walking to drop a report in, in this box. So tomorrow, should they say, oh, somebody reported this or that? I was like, mm, I saw you the other day. She was walking towards that box. Mm -hmm. So establishing a response mechanism is not something the organization should just sit. Okay, maybe the HR person, for example, just sit and say, oh, we need this, we need this, we need this. How are you engaging staff? How are you engaging persons who are affected by those policies mm -hmm. to find out? How would they prefer to report? Yeah. How do we make this reporting process as safe as possible? Mm -hmm. I've had an organization that they didn't just have the sexual harassment policy. They actually made sure that as part of their whistleblowers policy, that should somebody report a case mm -hmm. of maybe discrimination, harassment, bullying, and maybe let's say that we're both managers, I'm harassing someone, mm -hmm. you're my friend, mm -hmm. and um, Kim, reports a case against me. Mm. And then for some reason, because we're friends, mm. you start taking actions against Nkem. Mm -hmm. The policy protects Nkem from you. Mm. That way, when Nkem reports, for example, she's comfortable. Mm -hmm. She knows that there will not be any form of attack against her. Yeah. The organization makes sure that Nkem is protected. And even while the organization is investigating the matter, Nkem is still protected. Mm -hmm. And there's another part that is not so popular. While the organization is investigating, is investigating the matter, the perpetrator actually should be protected because until yeah, it is so proven yeah. that this has happened, mm -hmm. the organization is not supposed to because broadcast this person's name because what if you've done that and then upon investigation you find out that it's actually a false allegation. Yeah. So another thing that I look out for is when they report, do you act immediately? Mm -hmm. The timeline is actually very, very important. And another thing that is important, apart from the timeline, is do you provide feedback? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of organizations make sure that the investigation, the, the action, everything is confidential. Mm -hmm. But then how many times have they made sure that the person who has reported this case, that you go back to that and say, thank you so much for reporting this. We've taken action. Mm -hmm. This is what we did. This is what we did. This is what we did. That's then really finally, rare. yeah, it's very rare. very rare. Because what that does is that he gives, if Nkem is the one reporting, he gives Nkem her voice back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He makes Nkem feel that I am a valuable part of this system. Yeah. My rights have not just only been recognized, mm -hmm. they've been respected. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, Nkem can go home with that feeling that this organization has accepted or has recognized that something terrible has been done to me yeah. and they've done something against it. Yeah. And when other colleagues see yes. that, mm. yes. 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 yes, to encourage someone else to, to speak come for. Then the final thing I wanted to um, highlight, I think, <laughs> what that thing is that apart from the fact that we're providing feedback um, mm -hmm. to Kim, another thing I will look out for is um, how many organizations are actually bold enough. Because the truth of the matter is that various things that we list under sexual harassment is actually a crime. Mm -hmm. If you look at maybe the Nigerian constitution, if you look at the VAP Act, yeah. several of these things are actually crime within the Nigerian Federation. Mm -hmm. How many Nigerian organizations, be they schools, be they workplaces, mm -hmm. how many of them can proudly beat their chest that when somebody has been investigated and has been mm -hmm. found in violation of not just the organization's policy, mm -hmm. but in violation of the laws of the Federal Republic of, the Ni of Nigeria, that the organization takes that person and hands over to the authorities. Mm -hmm. How many organizations can say they're supposed to do that? Mm -hmm. But then, 
under the law, you're supposed you're supposed to. Yeah, Within the VAP Act, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be Uju going to report the case. Mm -hmm. A third party can report on Uju's behalf with Uju's consent exactly. if Uju is an adult. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But they forget that the power of an institution is usually larger than the power of an individual. Yeah. And then when they say, okay, yes, we've done, we've sorted it out, and we, we've dismissed the person. Dismiss the person to go and do what? To go and do what? Some organizations, well, try by making sure that when they dismiss the person, should any other organization contact them for, for referral, for referral yeah, they, they mention yeah. it. Yeah. But then there are some organizations that do not mention They say, hey, but what do you mean? You so that, uh, that we should hunt that person for the rest of the person's yeah. life. What you're helping other organizations do is this making sure that nobody else mm -hmm. falls victims and fall, falls victim mm -hmm. to that person's actions. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. I really appreciate this because mm -hmm. of that. This is actually very long and very educating. But then we'll have to go now because of time. Thank you very much, Ms. Obyanoju Osude, for this wonderful, interesting and educating session. And thank you so much, our viewers, for taking our time to join us today on this episode, Sexual Harassment in institutions. Join us next week again at 11 a.m. still on our Facebook page as we discuss policies that address sexual harassment. For now, I will say have a wonderful weekend and thank you for watching. Bye.